Hi everyone, here's what's bothering me today. I mentioned him a bit in a previous video, so it's time we talk about the senator, the social worker, and human rights activist, Calvin Ruck. Now, Calvin Ruck was born in Sydney, Nova Scotia, to parents who had immigrated from Barbados, and he unfortunately left school after the 10th grade to take a job as a laborer with the Dominion Steel and Coal Corporation in Sydney. He would eventually go on to um, become a sleeping car porter, which was, at this point in time, in um, the 1940s, one of the more common and one of the few avenues of employment that were open to black Canadians. But it was while working as a sleeping car porter that well and truly exposed him to the racism and indifference that black people faced from white Canadians. And it was a real wake-up call for him. He actually said, I felt obliged to protest, but organizing at the time seemed impossible. We were afraid to rock the boat. We thought we might end up with no job at all. Which, I mean, yeah, that probably would have happened. So while that was an awakening for him, he still doesn't quite get to that point just yet, uh, but it's definitely starting to foster this sense of activism within him. Uh, in 1954, he and his wife Joyce purchased a plot of land in Westville, a white suburb of Halifax, basically. Uh, but, again, he's once again confronted by racism, where the white residents and neighbors submit a petition for him to leave. <sighs> so, thankfully, the petitioners were unsuccessful, but of course this didn't sit well with him. And it left a lasting impression on him that finally was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back that led him to take action on the issue of racial segregation. So this brings us to Calvin Ruck's first political sit-in protest. Um, his first political action of the time was taking aim at local barbers who would often refuse to cut the hair of black people. So uh, Calvin Ruck and his children would actually protest this by sitting inside of the shops and refusing to leave. It basically uh, was effective in the sense that either, you know, they cut their hair and sort of had to get over their racism, or the sort of intimidation and presence of the black people would force other people not to um, partake in this business. They'd say, oh no, we can't go there. There's, there's black people there. And then they'd run and scurry away and it would lose business for the company. So it was pretty effective a strategy. So later, after various forms of protest in the 1970s, Ruck enrolled in the Maritime School of Social Work at Dalhousie University. This is where the more social activism thing gets more official, as it were. So he begins to work with the Department of uh, Social Services to improve housing, education, employment, healthcare, all these really good things that were um, being felt very acutely by the black community in Nova Scotia. And so um, this then leads him, as being an increasingly active member with, it, with contacts with the department, this brings it to the attention of the Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Nova Scotia S Association of Social Workers, and the Black Cultural Society of Nova Scotia. Which then brings us to his political career. So in 1981, he was appointed to the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, and he served in that for, I think, one full term of five years. And then after that, in 1986, he actually wrote a and published a book called Canada's Black Battalion, Number Two Construction Battalion, 1916 to 1920, which was a history of the Number Two Construction Battalion, which I've also made a video about. And he also did this as part of a campaign to uh, increase the recognition of the battalion as a significant part of Canadian history and also led to a commemorative plaque. Uh, to this battalion being erected in Pictou, Nova Scotia. So in the wake of his impressive career of being a social activist with the Department of um, Social Services and um, trying to bring more attention to the plight of black people in Canada and their history and their legacy, uh, he begins to become recognized for his work. He got honorary degrees from Dalhousie and the University of King's College. Uh, he also got the Order of Canada, which again is the highest civilian honor that you can get in Canada. And he also was appointed to the Canadian Senate, making him just the third Canadian senator to ever have that privilege at this point. But all good things, unfortunately, must come to an end. And in 2004, 
Calvin Ruck died after a battle with Alzheimer's disease at his home in Ottawa. After his passing, Nova Scotia Senator Donald H. Oliver stated that Calvin Ruck devoted his time and efforts to the service of others. During his life, he worked as a janitor, delivery driver, social worker, author, human rights officer, and finally as a senator. Regardless of the job, he never lost sight of his ultimate goal, improving the lives of all Nova Scotians. Indeed, he devoted his career and life to the betterment of others, particularly Nova Scotia's black community. I'd say that's a good legacy to leave behind. And it yet again reminds us of the fact that black people have been struggling for years to get the recognition that they need and deserve in this nation of ours. I've covered this a lot throughout the month of February and Black History Month and how Calvin Rock was one of the ones to try and get more um, honors and recognition of other black Canadians, especially black military veterans. I think it was either William Hall or um, Jeremiah Jones who had served with distinction and should have gotten medals and honor, but they sadly weren't in their time. This is an unfortunate reality that black people have been dealing with now for centuries in Nova Scotia and in Canada as a whole. We are making great strides. You know, now we're having, now we're talking about the first black cabinet ministers and some of the earliest senators and social activists and civil rights activists. And these are all good things, but it only starts happening after centuries of abuse and neglect. We should absolutely be thankful for the progress that is being made, but the fact that so much had to be done and still needs to be done and that it wasn't done itself until the 70s and the 80s is definitely what's bothering me today.